Welcome to the Golf Virtuosos podcast with me, James Jankowski. I'm delighted to be partnering up with some of the game's best upcoming coaches, Jack Bado and Jay Kelly with the full swing and Alex Buckner with the short game. Within our podcast, we hope to host some of the game's leading coaches within our specialist subjects. Alex has already hosted wedge game specialist, Dr. Rob Neal, and Jack Bado has already hosted world-renowned coach, Dennis Pugh. Yesterday in my first podcast, I sat down with leading Aimpoint instructor, Jamie Donaldson. We discussed the history of Aimpoint, how Aimpoint has developed over time, and how golfers could use Aimpoint to improve their green reading and therefore improve their putting. First of all, I apologize for any poor sound quality. Um, AirPods are perhaps not conducive to recording podcasts. So in the future, I'll be investing in some uh, better technology to record um, some better audio. But thank you, Jamie, for taking the time to sit down with me yesterday and listen in for some great insights into Aimpoint and green reading. So if anyone doesn't know who Jamie is, which I'm sure most of you do, um, it's probably the reason why you're here, but Jamie is uh, the go-to man when it comes to aim points in Europe. I think he's probably considered as Mark Sweeney's um, right-hand man, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to, to Europe. So we've got a lot of elite players and you know amateur golfers alike that go and see Jamie to improve their green reading skills. Yep, that's about true. right. Yeah. Very true. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yep. Yeah. I've got a series of, of things that I'd like to, you know, I, I want to learn myself as well. So it's really interesting mm. for me to get you on and to just chat about um, aim point and green reading in general. Um, so why don't we start with kind of how you got into, into aim point? Yeah, so um, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly interesting story, I guess. Uh, I fully qualified with the PGA in 97, um, fancied playing for a little bit, wasn't good enough, uh, and ended up uh, in Cambridge coaching. So uh, I was always interested in in coaching, but fancied that little period of getting playing out of the system. So played, wasn't good enough, um, and then started coaching in around uh, 2000 in Cambridge. Uh, It was always something I had an interest for, and it was something I considered I was fairly good at um so full-time swing coach pretty early on um and my mantra was always uh, i had very good sponsors and didn't have good enough technique didn't have good enough guidance didn't have a team around me so so from early on i was i know how to get it wrong so let me help you get it right so i was full swing coach uh, nothing else and about 2007 um i started to work with all my players on a monthly basis so there was no not so much the roll up i would have regular clients that were invested in holistic training so we had fitness coaches we had screening mild amount of psychology at the time which you know i'd I'd get there'd be group work and and i felt like i was ticking all the boxes and one of the areas i couldn't really answer people on was green reading. So when it came to putting, I had, I had the basic knowledge about teaching putting sort of standard stuff. Yeah. And, um, you know, at the time I was using quite a lot of 3d systems with, uh, Stuart Corstofin, uh, quite early on a doctor of using TrackMan for ball flight, uh, four camera systems, a lot of that sort of thing. So I was, I felt like I was ahead of the curve a little bit with technology, but didn't have an answer when it came to, uh, where to aim. And so uh, Aimpoint was something that was kind of introduced to me or mentioned to me. And then, then it was pretty much just a graphic on the golf channel. So Aimpoint's first product was a putt prediction engine, which would be used at live PGA Tour events. And whilst there's a live coverage of a tournament, uh, they had a, ca- a fixed camera above two of the greens. And Mark Sweeney, who created the computer program, has about 15, 1,500 lines of code. He would predict the ball's path from ball to hole. 
at the right speed, let's say. So is that the thing that we would speed. see on the on the on the TV back then, kind of showing the, then. the start line, and then yeah, kind blue of blue dotted line. That's it. And and he ran it, and uh, CBS were the first people to adopt it after years of of Mark promoting it to Golf Channel, who weren't interested. Uh, and it ran with a 99% success rate. So Golf Channel took it on and the rest is kind of history, as they say. So, so I knew it as, a, as watching PGA Tour coverage. Um, and uh, they, there was a coach at the time called John Graham that a lot of people would know. Uh, we, were, yep. we were kind of in touch. So John Graham came over, stayed with my family and I put it out to my client base. I said, we're gonna have some green reading classes uh meridian golf club were very kind to give me use of their greens they shut a hole off for us actually so i was teaching at a driving range and um jenny from meridian actually shut off a par three for a whole for two whole days so we could oh. run these classes i know great huh so we're on this big slopey green had 48 clients signed up for something no one had ever heard of which was green reading lessons um and we ran 12 classes, John and I, or pretty much John, I just watched. Yeah. Um, and there was a booklet which has 600 numbers in. Looks a bit like a dartboard, four dartboards. Some people might have seen that. And it's the answers to break. It's like a roadmap to break. Um, so that was amazing. And I, I got kind of hooked pretty quickly because I was into my science. And I realized that there was the solution to a problem that no one's ever mentioned and no one was mentioning. So yeah. um, I was in touch with Mark a lot and he was, I think he was working out in Bangkok and he connected through London and he messaged me one day and said, look, I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm in London for two days. I'll come and stay with you. I'd like to, to talk about Aimpoint. So, and, and I'm a full swing coach at this time, full diary, yeah. no yeah. real problems. So I'm like, great, come over. And he spent two days of us. Um, I wiped my diary clear. So he just shared with me everything. And it was mind boggling that the, the whole, everything behind creating the system, he just shared with me. Um, and then and then we did some coaching and he was coaching my, uh, my clients. And he asked me to help with delivery of the class and change things around a little bit. And what would I do? Because I was a PGA tutor at the time as well. So uh, I was yep. actually teaching people how to teach. So it was quite easy because I had the framework there. I just changed the language. Yeah. And um, so we did that for two days and then we went for a pizza with the family. Um, and it was, you know, <laughs> my wife was there. Uh, I think we had two boys at the time. And we were like, what's next? And it was like, I don't know. And, and, I, and it literally was a case of, well, you know what? I, I'm, this is amazing. I love this. I think I'd like to to become certified and he goes, well, that's no problem. Um, I'd like to coach it. And he said, um, well, you know, okay, what, what does that mean? I said, well, I think I'm going to hammer notice in and wow. he just, just come and coach green reading. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. It is a way. It's strange. Now I think about it, how it was, it wasn't planned. It just kind of came out of dinner. My wife said, if that's what you want to do, uh, and Mark was like, well, well, hold on, you know, don't go mad. And I was like, no, no, I, I think, this is right. So, uh, so that was it. So that was probably November. How many, 20. how many aim point coaches were there at that, at that point? At the time there must've been 20, I think all in the States. Okay. At the most 20, 20 total. No, I mean, the that, that, there's a, there was a reasonable few of, of aim point instructors already in the U S but it hadn't really kind of taken mm. off anywhere else. That's it. Well, you know, and, and also, um, so, so Europe was open wide, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I could see a, an opportunity, but I was, I was more excited about the fact that there was a, a start, a middle and an end to this process. Like, yeah. you know, I've been coaching and, and coaching is a contu continual journey, right? It's, it's endless change and development. And you never, I, I guess you never really master it as a player. Yeah. And I was just addicted to this. People turn up for a class not able to do something and leave the class world mm. class at doing something. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so, so literally I kind of wrote an exit plan for where I was coaching in Cambridge. Um, and I did a five year plan and I'd smashed it within six months. Um, and in January, 
2010, I'm at Bay Hill coaching Dickie Pride, who was a PGA <laughs> Tour player. And, and it was like, wow. And, um, you know, pretty quickly started working with players, uh, took it to uh, LET Tour a lot, European Tour, PGA Tour. Um, and the, the, the biggest thing was I was helping develop the system. And Mark gave me all the answers to the questions, but we were coming up with the questions and how to relate it to coaching. So that was yeah. what I brought to the table there was, was you know, the, the drill work, the solutions to stroke issues. You know, he had the where to aim. And now we, we kind of reverse engineered back to why the ball doesn't go where it should. Yeah. Um, so fast forward now to 2014. Uh, we're in Spain and Mark's been talking about using fingers to predict break. Um, yeah. So it's 2014. I understand how to do it clueless as to where we're going with this because our business was these booklets, these charts, these aim charts uh, were part of the business. Um, and, and, and literally we, were at, we had an instructors conference in Spain in 2014. And uh, we, Mark, there was a, we were at Jason Floyd's Academy in, um, where is it? It's in, it's in Marbella and it's, uh, it's his old academy. Doesn't matter. Anyway, he's out there. He's got this academy, lots of players there. We're using the Green Fire Instructors Conference and we were umming and ahhing whether to show people this system. Yeah. And and he called over a, what, a, a lad there who was a European tour player, a Spanish guy, Canizares' brother, I think. And there was 30 instructors now in Europe, all, all on this screen, probably a lot more, but 30 at this instructors conference. And Mark just called him over and said, Jamie, teach him the finger thing <laughs> and I'm like okay <laughs> and everyone sort of <laughs> gathered around and it was like and, and basically we made up how to teach it on the spot so I took him very slopey green very quick green so I introduced him to slope feel show him roughly the arm bend for that speed green put the ball down bear in mind there's there's 30 people in a short area so I didn't really have a GPS on the shape of the green I'm on yeah. So I drop a ball down and said, now do this read to that hole that's 20 feet away. So he goes out, has a feel, comes back, says five. Now, five is a big slope. We're yeah. talking a lot of break. So yeah. he comes in, does five fingers, and it was like this 78-inch break. And I've looked at <laughs> it, and I'm like, that can't be right. And he goes, what? And I'm like, you just got to hit it. And everyone was like, no way. And I'm thinking, you know, this is, this is, uh, <laughs> this is sketchy to say the least. So anyway, cut a long story short, he sets up. Everyone says, oh, it can't be right. What have you done wrong? And I'm like, just hit the putt, just hit the putt. He hits it. Then this putt had 78 inches of break. I'm going to say <laughs> hold it. He probably didn't, but it just missed if it didn't go in. And it was like a real holy shit moment, right? It was, yeah. uh, oh my God. And the, and the read took eight seconds. Yeah. So off we go inside and um, we sit down and, and, and it's, everyone's like, wow, what's this? We're, we're selling books. What's this read? You've just up, you know, you've totally turned our world upside down. Um, and, and that was it. And, 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 and we had a meeting about what to call it because everyone was like, wow. So we, uh, we called it Express because it's like pain really fast acting, yeah. very quick. 10 second was the average read time. I think that's what people, um, people will think of. Aimpoint is actually they yeah. is Aimpoint Express, right? Like a lot of people think well, that's they, it. Oh, they're doing Aimpoint when actually they're doing Aimpoint Express, not kind of what yeah. Aimpoint originally was. No, very few people use the books nowadays. Um, yeah. The the you know the the solution we needed to get things done quicker, and that's where Express came in, and it was a chart. It was for kids originally, and you know now let's now now we've released it, we've given it a name. Um, we're, we're teaching the instructors how to teach it, kind of making it up on the spot. And um, uh, uh, January, uh, Brian Gay is the first tour player to use it, PGA tour player, used it in Hawaii, made loads of putts. Um, yeah. He's talking about the grain. He's talking about where the ocean is. People are talking about the volcano. Brian Gay's just, you know, put the chart away and he's holding his fingers up. So he puts nicely in Hawaii. Um, Is that January 2015? Yeah, I think. Uh, 
Then Stephen Bowditch wins on PGA Tour. Yeah. Aimpoint Express. You know, he's using it. Um, I don't think any of us coached him. Um, and then, and then there's the call from Bay Hill. So Bay Hill's on. Adam Scott rings up and says, um, "Well, I'm using Aimpoint Express anyway. Perhaps you better show me how to do it properly." So he, he gets coached. Uh, Mark lives over the water from Bay Hill, so he uh, probably took his speedboat over to Bay Hill. And <laughs> have you got some of these coaching. players, like these PGA Tour players, using Aimpoint Express without actually yes. having any formal coaching and how to actually yep. do it properly? Yeah, well, Amazing. Adam shot 62 using it and hadn't been taught how to do it. <laughs> so he shoots 62 at Bay Hill. He learns how to do it properly, wins the Honda Classic next week. <laughs> um, and, and the thing was, we were still saying, oh, you know, we've got this office full of books. We sell books. We sell charts. Aimpoint is a chart-driven yeah. read. And our hand was forced because now everyone's talking about the finger thing. Um, so it kind of killed the chart business overnight but um mark's only ever done things to improve people's ability you know so it was a natural progression to, to yeah. release it um and, and it makes so know, much more sense for your average your uh, average golfer as well yeah 100 percent. well for the tour players as well I, i've you know i've been I've, I've coached coached this for a long time now and the average visual misread is about 50 percent People seem to choose half of what should be there visually. Um, and I've got to say, I could probably count on one hand the amount of players, elite amateurs, or anyone that I've coached who says, yes, are they there? So no that one is, seems is to that, Is that why Aimpoint, um, you know, typically has adopted a method for understanding the slope of using your feet as opposed to yep. your eyes to see it? Yeah, there's no eyes at all. I mean, you've pretty much got to go along the route of your eyes are being deceived all the time. Yeah. Um, and, and you know what? The other thing is, you know, now if we sort of circle back to using it for coaching, if, if you're teaching putting, and so you, where would you aim? And someone says, I would aim there. Yeah. It's just a, a, a space. It's not a unit. Yeah. So, so, so now if it's wrong, how what what how do you you can't increase it if there's no units you you know if it's 50 percent bigger read 50 yeah, percent bigger yeah. than their prediction yeah. so so that's where it was exciting for coaching because it gives you a metric now to say let's move that three units wider yeah or you're aiming two units below where you need to be and now it's okay so now they can start to work it out um uh yeah so and that was it and then expressive it was off it was flying and um I, you know what? We haven't done it for a long time, but we had well over a hundred tour wins a year ago, um, and you know I think we've probably taught about seventy-five, eighty thousand people now. Uh, Amazing, minimum. Yeah, of, yeah, that have learned it. Um, and well, I guess you know, that, that sharp, you know the, the the big thing about Aimpoint in in its simple form is most golfers, you know, even even to uh, to a degree like elite players. You ask them, how do you read a green? You know, I'll get mm. players in, in see me and I'll go, well, how do you, yeah. how do you read this part? And they go, oh, uh, you know, just outside left. You know, that's yeah. the first thing they say. And I go, well, how did you come to that conclusion? Exactly. There's no method to come to that conclusion. They go, oh, it just looks like it would do that. Exactly. And, and like, I think um, people get good at guesstimating break, let's say, but yeah. now it could be linked to their switch, their putting issues like aim or dynamic yeah. aim so all of a sudden um you know they they after a while they their their combined faults equal a success yeah and they're the players that tend to be very streaky or you know i always use this as an adage which is you can have the best stroke in the world but if you can't aim it or read a green you're gonna you're gonna have a, a bad perf yeah. poor performance yeah. and, and quite often you know misread misstroke the ball goes in yeah. So some people just get lucky every now and then and it's enough. Yeah, I, mean, I think in, in my personal perspective, like when I, when I didn't have the indoor platform where I was able to move the slope, mm. you know, I'd help mm. people mechanically with their stroke and then they'd come mm. back to me and I'm going, I'm missing all my putts this side or, yeah. or high or low. And because yeah. we hadn't actually taken into account that their stroke was a bias towards their, their aim or their read, 
So it's like yeah. everything creates a picture. And really, the first the first part of the picture is the read, not mm. the stroke itself. Yeah, we, we use it as a cornerstone. The three keys to putting for us would be where you're going to aim, suitable speed, and then start line, and, and everything that yeah. happens in between those pieces. But I think, you know, it's... I, I think inadvertently what Aimpoint did it it opened up coaching as well it, it you know if it, it's it's taught it, it said that putting can be predictable break is predictable purely predictable yeah. so it's basic physics so so you know people before just had the knack or just they just get it or you know he's got this amazing uncanny knack for reading greens it it, it meant a lot more people failed that maybe would have been successful otherwise yeah you know yeah an adage which we all use coaches good coaches is is why guess when you can measure right yeah yeah exactly yeah I, I think I fall into what that category you just mentioned of being someone who just got you know able to predict the slope with my eyes quite well I, I guess I did have a method to it but I'd be someone who pictured the curve and then pictured a straight line I think like for me um Tiger Woods golf was yes. a big help just the visual yeah. thing a straight line and a curved line moving away from that line i go oh yeah like light, light bulb moment that that's actually what a, a ball does yeah and if if it broke low you would just shift your aim line and shift your curve wider yeah. so what, what you've done is you you'll say okay next time i see something that looks like that i will move it out more whereas yeah. a lot of people you know they i mean at least that's something right at least yeah. you had something to, to base it on. A lot of people just, you know, feel or go well, with possibly, instinct. Possibly that developed over the fact that I felt like I had a decent stroke. I think if mm. you're a, you know, a golfer that doesn't tend to aim very well or hit it actually mm. where you're aiming, then green reading is going to be a struggle because, you know, you're not getting feedback for your putts. But did you miss that because of the read or the, the execution yeah. or, you know, they don't really know what happened. Yeah. And, you know, uh, with, 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 everything that happens before you hit a putt is a, is a part of a process. Um, and we've spent a lot of time also timing players and looking at habits before they putt. And, and I think what the other thing that Aimpoint brings to the table is it's a repeatable process, which is step A, step B, step C. It's, yeah. it's the same process again and again and again. And the psychologists love Aimpoint because it keeps you present. What you're doing is you're feeling the slope, you're appropriate to distance, and then you come back and you're, you're predicting where you need to start the ball. And then you can say, right, I need to start the ball on that line. And then you choose your speed, if you like. And then you choose, or you start mapping your curve. And then you start rehearsing your stroke based on all those pieces. And it keeps you present. Whereas you're not saying, mm, well, I've had this putt before and it breaks more than I think. And then you go to the other side and say, you know, it's downhill now. And this is quite easy to get it three foot by and put pressure on my next part. And we would, they're living in the present, sorry, living in the past and the future. Yeah. And, 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 you know, that has them jumping around. Yeah. Whereas, you know, your process is the same time, the same, same routine. And that keeps people very, um, very grounded, very, yeah. very much in a problem solving, in a systematic problem solving format. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's why we get like a, massive placebo effect if you like for want of word people learn aim point and they go and do crazy stuff quickly yeah uh, always there's always a massive spike in performance and it might be just because they're saying right i've got a relatable process now yeah i can relax and let it happen um I, or it's because they've now got good targets and they're aiming better and they can start it on the right line with the right speed but we see it an awful lot yeah i think i think as well like you you one thing you mentioned there that kind of makes sense is the process. If you, if you miss a putt, you know, ordinarily, you might be thinking of, oh, the last putt I, I missed. So, you know, maybe I need to do something yes. a little bit differently. Whereas, <laughs> yep. you know, if you're using aim point as your, as your method, you miss a putt, you go, oh, I just didn't quite get that one correct. The next one, you just do the same process. A bit like a golfer that, you know, hits a hook. And mm. then, you know, the next tee, all they're thinking about is that hook. Well, actually, if you have a don't go left process, yeah, yeah, but then they're, they're going to have more success for the next one. Hundred percent. I mean, when you you know, I teach people to to miss and understand why. I mean, a big part of my coaching is okay. That that missed here. What what pieces could cause that? You know, did it curve more or less than you expected? Is the speed sufficient? You know, is our start line good? Strike and all those things and. 
and and you know you hear players say oh, i just i just couldn't get i just couldn't the putting wouldn't click today or it's not there today well you know when you miss on the first and you start to go through a process of what what went wrong and you can make changes you can start to find performance yeah um, you know a lot of speed issues are because of misreads yeah so 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 you know if you didn't change your reads and you you know you might be having to hit that putt hard to have any chance of hitting the hole yeah so now the subconscious is making you hit it hard you're yeah. thinking hit it softer and we and then you're in trouble and and also if the if the read is lower than it should be even if they hit mm. at the same speed mm. it's yes yeah. going further away from the hole near. 100%. I mean, once you're half a percent, half a degree out on your start line, low, it's missed. Amazing. Think about that for a minute, apart from <laughs> very short putts. What, yeah, once, once you're half a degree low of the centre of the cup at the right speed, you're in trouble. Wow. Have a think about that. So basically, and that's where we see, um, we, we now started to see players with a, with a, a high start tendency. Yeah still make good putts yeah. so so you know we're now we're relating everything back to coaching down to technique down to cause and effect down to uh we you know seeing the curve you know plotting the path of the ball um you know a lot of what people do is based on what they think the ball is going to do and yeah. what they've really got to do to make it do that yeah so so technique is is kind of you know it's, it's third fourth on my list when it comes to to changing people's performance yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it does yeah. have a does have a place but quite often they need to do it they need to have a signature because of their bad aim or bad reads yeah um and and it's easy to get people out of bad habits as well so i don't believe anyone's stuck in a pattern yeah i've, I've seen that a lot in in my coaching if someone is aiming let's say a, a putt is breaking from their their aim point is two feet right but they're aiming you know, one foot to the right. If they don't mm. push that part, they're going to miss, right? Exactly. But if you get them aiming two feet right, they don't push that part. Exactly. They, and they, they, they and get they, a much better part. Yeah, and they'd be looking at putt, toe flow, putters that move differently to stop things happening. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, or, or even just saying, oh, uh, that happens. What am I, you know, that's just me. I'm going to carry on doing that wrong. Yeah. Um, hundred percent. I mean, I don't believe anyone's stuck in a, a pattern, um, realistically. No. Uh, and I've, I've, I've done several tests where we've, we've, we've used TrackMan or something to, to check start lines and, uh, we've given them misreads and then given them good reads and the data on the good reads is better than the misreads. Yeah. Uh, normally with speed and, uh, and I'll say, what happened there? And they'll say, I just smashed it. Yeah. And I'm like, everything else was good. And they go, yeah, I just smashed it. So they think I've given them the right read, you see. <laughs> so they'll hit the part. It'll go five foot by and they'll go, Oof, I just, just felt myself whack it. And I'll say, what, you accelerated too hard or stroke too long? And they'll go, oh, you know, just, I just do that sometimes. Then you give them <laughs> same distance with the right read in a different hole. And they'll hit it sweet. You know, what, what was different there? Oh, yeah, I, sh I shortened my back swing. You're like, mm, okay. <laughs> It's the same metric. people people are uh, i think even you know any kind of golfer they're more intuitive than they think oh huge I, I i really really believe subconscious comes up an awful lot intuition massive i think it's i think it's untapped as well i think yeah. it's we what do you think of, we think of it. the typical the typical um golfer today who has you know, we were talking before we start recording about, you know, the information is, you know, unparalleled today. Like you can, mm. you can find information anywhere and people yep. know everything about the golf swing. And it's almost like the art of playing golf is kind yep. of forgotten. And if people can just go out there and play golf and not play yeah. golf swing or not play putting strokes. 100%. Then, yeah. You know, and, and, and Instagram and all these things, uh, everyone's looking at their phones all the time and they and they'll see someone win and oh maybe that putter i should be using that and yes yeah. there's too much it's, it's too much access really and people have forgotten just to play golf and enjoy it yeah. you know and compete you know the, i know people uh, who think they got to 
he, I know someone who's probably going to listen to this who, who felt his swing had to be right before he could even consider competing. Um, and that could be an endless journey, right? That could be a, that could be one of those constant chases. I yeah. mean, you, I, yeah. mate, I, I had success as a player and I, I, I hit it all over the place. You know, I, I yeah. came into golf from cricket and tennis and other sports and never really had lessons. Yeah. And I just found, a, I was just a good competitor. I just got it around the golf course. Yeah. And obviously as I got better, it, it didn't help me. But, you know, uh, you got, there's still the art of scoring. Yeah. And no one has all the answers. I think, I think that um, us as coaches, you maybe mentioned it earlier, we kind of, we want people to learn from our own mistakes. Because I was the same, yes. I wanted to be a player and, you know, had a brief amount of success as a player. Mm. But I was always very technical, especially mm. when it came to golf swing. And then when people asked me, you, your strength was putting, you know, what did you work on technically? Mm. And I was like, I never had a putting lesson. Yeah, I had one, exactly. I had one, in fact, I had one putting lesson with my swing coach, Matt Belsham. Right. And he goes, I know, Matt. Yeah, yeah. he goes, it's fine. And that was it. <laughs> yeah, that's quite standard, Matt. I like yeah. that. <laughs> that is a Matt. That is a Matt Putton lesson. But you know, that is a Matt. Did I ever think about the, the the technical aspects of my stroke? I was like, no, I just need to start it there, get it online, and and I kind of let natural instinct of what felt right to me to do. To do, yeah, yeah. I mean, and to be fair, there's, that was what everyone relied on until until now. Now we've yeah. got we've we've got all the answers now. You see. I think that's where exactly how to. I can say it also where like people think that they're going to see a coach, and they think they should go away with a lot of technical information as how to get better. Whereas actually, you know, Aimpoint is one of the you know big steps in towards where it's not just about technique. Well, I guess it's a technique of sorts of how to read a green, but it's it's something different to the you know the technical mechanics of. Yeah. We, it, we don't, you know, it, it's it's not it's not about what it looks like. It's about how effective it is yeah. in relation to good targets. Yeah, and, and that's how that's how a coach. It's like, um, you know, what and people always say early on, "What's it? What's my stroke look like?" I say, "I don't know. I'm, I haven't even looked at that. I'm watching what, how the ball behaves. You know, yeah. does it behave in relation to what you wanted it to do or needed to do?" Yeah, but, you know, we we you know we we do a lot of performance. As well, so Aimpoint would also, um, I guess, uh, there's a system called My Game Forge, uh, which is also under yep. the Aimpoint and, and banner. It's a, a metric system, very clever system that that understands performance and categorizes it. And it's, it's the DNA of scoring, if you like. And um, we, you know, what I found with that is uh, the, the amount of drill based scenario based games that now I bring into my coaching yeah. because putts have a different flavor you know uh, a bad chip shot will leave you with a 7 to 12 foot par putt for a tour player yeah that feels different to a 7 foot birdie putt from two good shots into the yeah. green um and you know we 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 use that heavily on uh, changing the scenario in place. What we don't, you know, if you're just hitting a putt, hit a putt to that hole, it's just a putt. But then when you give people seven of them and say, you have seven putts for birdie from nine to 20 foot in your round of golf, I'm going to give you seven chances to make birdie. Things are always a little bit different. Yeah. And then you give them two chances inside eight feet. And then you give them three long 20 to 50 foot two putts. And that'll be their, you know, the, Greens and red, where they're not that close to the pin, so now it's putting pressure on three putt. And yeah. The amazing thing with them is people hit it to four foot, and then you see them sweat. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. And it's what's happening. Yeah. And they go, "Well, this is, this is, you know, I made three birdies earlier. This is my par putt to stay alive." Then I throw the ball off the green and say, "You miss four greens around. Get your wedge out." And now they've got good chip shots and bad chip shots. And once again, you see uh, routines change. You see. Yeah, and, and I think that drives technique. You know, I love that. More so you, you're bringing scenarios into yeah. into the performance game because I, you know, I use performance games, but I ha- I've never thought of of changing the context of, of yes. the putt from birdie putts to par putts and that there sort of stuff. It, I've been doing it for about a year now, and it, and just in discussion with them, you know, that you see them get annoyed after a bad chip. You know, what are you <laughs> going to do here? And, and they get aggressive or 
uh, with one one guy that I've been working with. Um, his his uh, he, he'll hit two two bad chips around out of four. Let's say, yeah, yeah. So two he'll two he'll stiff. Two would be in the sort of twelve foot range. Um, and what it was was we identified that these were the putts that he wasn't making, and they were the uh, momentum savers or the clutch yeah. putts we'd call them. So he'd make five birdies around, but also make two or three bogeys. Yeah. So so we were looking at scoring opportunity. How are we going to change it? And it was because he was not wanting a two or three foot putt for bogey. So his par wow. saves from twelve feet were weak. And what he didn't do was change his read. He just got protective. So his read stayed the same and everything was kind of dribbling up low and short of the hole. Um, and it, and it, I would never have figured that out if we hadn't gone through those games. Yeah, yeah. And used those kind of stats. Um, yeah, so that's been cool. And, and aim point now heavily into speed, distance control. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned it earlier. We've, we've, we've figured out curve. We we um we can we can plot the path of any ball on any surface, any distance, any slope values now, um, and and that came out of uh, another trip to Spain, another instructor's certification, not certification, another conference in Spain. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was picked up by Sweeney in Malaga Airport, but I, before I got on the plane, I was looking at an interview with Ross Fisher, okay. and he he shot sixty in St Andrews. And they interviewed him. It, it must have been the Dunhill or something. They interviewed him um, and said, so that was impressive. What happened? He said, well, today I could see the lines. And they were like, oh. And he said, I got down and everything went dark around the green, but I could see a big white line. He goes, the white line was so clear today. And I remember thinking, what? So he, he just waits for this white line vision to appear so like you know we start smoking something all right before we play because because <laughs> most people will be scared if it all went dark around the green and think they're having some kind of acid trip right <laughs> but um so I remember, I remember thinking about it, all the way out to Malaga I was like he like he wants he's a curb seer right he's a curb seer so he he wouldn't use aim point because aim point at that time was a fixed aim perpendicular yeah. to the hole yeah 20 inches from the edge of the hole whatever I remember thinking, oh, we're missing a trick here because people obviously see the curve. Yeah. Got off. So we're in, we're in the airport, in the airport car park, and there was all these white lines in the car park. And I was like, well, if the ball's here and this is here, I spent about 20 minutes with Mark and uh, Gareth McShay, who's an Irish coach. And I pretty much convinced Mark that we should go back to the hotel and see if we could find one point on every single putt where it's in a tight enough area that we could predict it in play. So anyway, we spent a whole afternoon with other coaches like Brian Ridley. Um, and we had coins all over the floor in this hotel room. And Mark had the computer with me, had the computer simulation. So he would, we, um, we could plot this curve. Um, and after a while, we found that there was an area where the ball was pretty much always in a fairly tight confine. Um, and that was it. And we called it drop point. And it happens after the apex. The apex moves around a lot. So the apex is quite unpredictable. But drop point is certainly, we've got it down to about 8%, um, 8 uh, variable, which is good enough. Um, so yeah, so, so, so then we applied it to big slopes, quicker greens. And, and so, so now we're plotting curve and um, and this this might ring true of you. I go back now to all the people who put a tee peg by the hole. So someone puts a tee peg in where they want to aim, and then they start it higher, and it hits the tee peg, and miss, obviously the hole's lower. So we used to see people who would push and pull putts to get to the tee peg, um, and they're people that should be using curve. So so we started to say, okay, where where would you where I want you now to visualize curve. Um, so we do the aim point. I'll do the quick maths for drop point. What, with that, I'd put a buy? disc down and I'd say, that's where the ball has to be. And they would say, well, the aim point's too high and the drop point's too low. And I'd be like, what? So you wouldn't roll it over that coin? And they'd say, no. 
So we'd hit it, it would roll over the coin, let's say it goes in the hole, and they'd be like, holy shit, you know, that the, so my perpendicular aim I think is too high and my curve is too low. So now we've got this real uh, conflict going with two styles of visualizing a putt. Uh, so, so they'd be non-linear, people that like curve. Um, and the amazing thing is, is what it does again to technique. If you can differentiate someone from a straight line to a curve seer, um, we've got some answers now as to why they push and pull putts or why they aim badly or why they miss putts. Because um, I've got people who've got real start line issues. We give them curve and they hit that intermediate disc every single time. I'm sure you've seen it because I know you do some stuff as well. So, so what changed? Uh, what changes their perception of what the ball has to do? If you like, we're feeding the intuition. No. Well, with that, um, do you find you get players that see a combination of both, like a straight line yeah. and a curved line? Or do you find yep. that I've seen players where it, it changes from slope? You know, one might be, they might see a curve on a left to right. And a, and a straight line on the right to left. Yeah, and uh, inside six feet, uh, people that like a straight line of aim, because um, now the hole's in their peripheral vision, the curve works better. Yeah. So when they're, very, when they're very aware of the hole, they can become very curve orientated. But when they come out to line on ball now at 10 feet and above kind of thing, they just rely on the line, so now they're linear. Uh, it's a complete mismatch. And also I have people where we swap it in and out depending on performance. Yeah. You know, I've got people that, that, are, that are, it's just things aren't clicking. So we, we scrap the line. Let's go curve. I like that. Now, how, what have we cured? Sometimes it's not obvious, but, you know, a lot of my guys are competing regularly and it's, we're just keeping them in that, in that make percentage range. You know, that's all I work on. It's, yeah. we, you know, it's we're not trying to have the best looking action we're just trying to exist at 60 percent of all your 20 foot birdie 20 foot and in birdie putts yeah so that's the metric i use from not how many chances from zero to 20 feet do you give yourself and can you make 60 percent of those and, and and that's it yeah do you see so you're saying there that you have players where sometimes that will change one 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 time you'll see, you'll see them and they're kind of a linear player and then the next that might not be working so well and they start to see the curve and then yeah changes yeah we and line on ball you know what happens is uh you know when everything's going well for a tour player they they're they're happy and then if they start missing a few parts or they they their speed there's an issue or something might happen at a certain event for a couple of days different greens different scenarios they start to want to tinker yeah. and i'm quite happy to say scrap the line if you want and we'll yeah. we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, it, yeah, we're just we're just trying to be, see, we're trying I to stay saw, in that sweet spot. I saw an uh, interesting comment from Jordan Spieth. This is a while ago, and it, and it kind of intrigued me. Is when he he had two majors. I, f I forget which ones it was. Where he mentioned you know he putted really well and he won, but he said his stroke was completely different. And like there's yeah. a guy admitting that. You know, he hasn't kept the same technique. He's he's just a very good putter, and obviously, what he does, he does very well. But it's mm. it's not always the same. Not at all. And I think you know, I've seen strokes change on length of putt as well. Yeah, I've seen people's yeah, everything changes. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think I think it's I don't think I think it's dangerous to label ourselves and to say that's me and that's all I'm gonna be. Yeah, and that's because it's it just doesn't work like that, and it's. I wouldn't even be surprised if, if working on, working with different training aids on full swing can impact putting, yeah. especially if it's something to do with alignment or visuals or you know the amount of times I get my you know you, the guys setting up with the, the high left shoulder because all they've done is pound driver for for weeks, <laughs> and you, you get them into putting posture and they're like this, yeah, and the ball the ball goes forward and their chest comes open and left shoulder higher. And, and it's almost like they just get into this golf comfort position. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think. I think, and I, and I think people are quite happy for their, you know, their, their technique to change. You know, if they want to hit a fade or a draw, or if they want to play mm -hmm. a low shot or yeah. whatever. But they go on the putting green and think they need exactly the same stroke and they need to do the same things. And you're like, no, that's that you adapt. Two two things I hear a lot is I just want to feel comfortable. 
and I just want to be consistent. <laughs> and, and that's yeah. from the young tour players. And that's, that seems to be, you know, if they're comfy and consistent, they're happy, right? Which is, which is, they just need to be effective. Yeah. You know, you just have to be, you have to just fall into that category. Yeah. Um, but what is comfort? You know, that's, I've got, I've had a lot of chats in lockdown, a lot of Zoom calls with players. And, you know, and when they talk about comfort, I, I say, well, what, how do you know you're comfortable? And will yeah. you ever be comfortable? You know, what, what, I just want to be comfortable. Well, what, what is comfortable? Do you, do you stand over a part and think about something? Is it a thought process? Because it's not a physical feeling, is it? It's not a, it, where does it come from? Where does this euphoria of comfort come from? And then they go and make seven or eight birdies and they go, yeah, I was just comfortable out there. Yeah. And you're like, well, I guess make birdieing one, two and three helped. Oh yeah. I'd, I'd be, yeah, I'd be comfortable at three under par through three holes. Yeah. Rolling in a massive putt on 10. <laughs> yeah. I just, I was comfortable today. And you're like, mm. so that, that's, that's on my notes at the moment is, and I'm, you know, working with, really good psychologist called Bevis Moynian is, you know, what, what do you say when someone wants to just be comfortable? I mean, what is the correct answer? Because now we can't put ourselves in their bodies and know what they're thinking. So, so I think comfort is attached to a day they putted great and they just perceive it was free flowing perhaps. I don't know. Yeah. But there's one thing for us, you know, it's, as coaches, they just want to be comfortable, right? Yeah. <laughs> what well, does it mean? Yeah, you get, and you get, well, you make a change, they feel uncomfortable, right? Physically, mm. I guess they feel uncomfortable. Mm. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the one that you said as well, consistency, I just want to be consistent. And I went up, that's the, you know, that's the goal of the best player in the world. They want to be more consistent. Yep. You know, if you, if you yeah. were the most consistent player, you'd be the best player because... <laughs> exactly. Do you think Dustin Johnson says, well, that's it now. I'm just going to, this is my blueprint. I'm never going to change. Yeah. He'll be tinkering and changing and... You know, it's that that chase, that sort of carrot, that uh, you know, that setting the boundaries a little bit beyond what you're capable of. Um, it's difficult in putting because no one's ever led the stats on putting for a, for a long period of time. No. no, they all take turns, and the stats have been the same for twenty years. The make percentages haven't changed. It's so it's, um, it's the most volatile. Yes, statistic, right? You look at you look at the putting week on week. You know, if you're if you're a consistent putter, doesn't exist. No, basically, you and know, that's the better, point. A better putter exists, someone who's better, mm -hmm. but someone who's mm -hmm. more consistent than the next is very hard. Doesn't to exist. Spieth, Spieth kills it at twenty feet every now and then, and that's when he tends to win. Yeah. Um, but no, I can't think of any other player that's done that ever. And, and, and people always say to me, who's your favourite? Who's the best putter? Who's your favourite? No, you can't pick one. No. Um, you know, and they talk a lot about um, Brad Faxon was the, the best putter on tour. Um, he missed more greens than anyone else. He was actually one of the best chippers on tour. Yeah. So he, has a, he had a low one putt count, but they were all tidying up for par. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, and stroke, that's where stats have improved. Strokes gained is definitely mm. a big improvement yep. um, over stats previously. But even, the, even then, you know, strokes gained has its flaws, whether it's, yeah. you know, round on round, every eight foot accounts the same. So if I've got a 3% downhill right to left part mm. or a straight up the hill eight foot, they count the same. You know, yeah, maybe over a season or whatever, those those strokes gain stats kind of even out. But yeah, you know, we don't have the, the the true statistics sometimes. No, that's it. It's um, that you know, once again, all putts have a different flavour, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, you a classic would be uh, Justin Thomas when he won in Memphis. Uh, he came out as fifty five, placed fifty fifth in putts gained. Um, right. And pe people were saying, you know, it's because of his ball striking. He won that tournament because of that. Well, he, he had the same amount of putts as, as the next best guy. Yeah. But he, he was putting. He, he hit it down the flag for the whole tournament. He, his, he, he hit it so close that he was losing strokes gained putting. Yeah. Even when he was one putting. Yeah. You know, because someone would hold a 15-footer to his seven-footer and they would, have a, they would gain more points. I saw, um, I saw, was it Snedeker when he shot, 
Did he shoot 28 for nine holes or something last season? And he lost mm-hmm. strokes game putting. Yeah, um, yeah. That round or that it's, that nine. It's, it's it definitely needs leads to better interpretation. You have got to link yeah. it to proximity for sure. Yeah. That's that's why I like I like stats programs as well that um, yeah. that take into consideration. And I'm sure they could do that now with the technology they have on the PGA Tour, but mm. that factor into the equation the slope, you know. And yeah, yeah, they must be able to because they they the greens are mapped and they know the location of the ball. Yeah. So all all it takes is um, Something like Mark to help them. Mark could do that, yeah. Once you've once you've three D mapped those greens and you and and shot link tell you the distance to the hole, uh, we could give it a make percentage rating based on the slopes as well and the speeds. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, exactly. Mm, that's cool. Um, right. Oh. So I, I do have another question. Um, we've covered yep. it, I suppose, but um, we're talking earlier about like the myths that surround aim point that it's you know not mm. very. Um, adaptable and you know what about wind or what about grain or you know, do you have mm. to hit it nine inches past every time or, or yeah yeah so I'd like to well, hear your comments the, on that the I'm going to give you the I'm going to give you the corporate answer on that um, well in, in a clinic when we're teaching eight people for two hours yeah they get a lot of information we want them to leave the class world class at something yeah so we have the start, middle, and end process, and we give them six to twelve inches past as a benchmark, because yeah. we want to teach them where to stand, how to use the arm bend, based on that. Because if we had to change it for your three foot past guy or the guy dying it in, we'd have to speak a different language to everyone in the class. Yeah. So we give a benchmark of nine inches past for two reasons. One of them is because that way we can teach everyone the same, and they don't go, "Well, how come his arms more bent, or how come he's standing there?" Everyone does the same based on that foot pass speed. So that's one reason we do it in a class. So level one would be learning it the same as everyone, let's say. Yeah. Um, but also more putts lip in than lip out at nine inches past. So, so realistically, we take the standpoint of you've got to get it six inches past because the imperfections in the green will knock the ball offline otherwise. Yeah. So about a five pound note length. Yeah. Um, so six inches minimum. That, that way it de- it's moving end over end still. Um, and at six inches past, you know, look, you've lost a, a half inch each side of the ball. It, the, the, the entrance to the hole is smaller. Yeah. Uh, and when you get to a foot past, it shrinks very fast. So if you want to be a foot by, you have to be even more accurate with your entry. So it becomes a bit harder to hold putts. Yeah. And um, so that's the two reasons we stipulate those distances. And also, when you watch PGA Tour, they're always a foot past the hole. Yeah, yeah. They always hit it a foot past the hole. Wanna... Because no, Sorry, no one wants a three foot of a par, do they? You don't want to give yourself a target that's, um, you know, too far past the hole that you can hit it too hard and you, you make entry speed a problem. And you also don't want to give yourself a target mm-hmm. where actually you could leave this putt short. Exactly. So, so, you know, it's, 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 you don't want a long second putt for a start. Um, and, and, you know, so we get flexible with players. If, if you want to, if, if every putt has a different flavor, we use that phrase a lot today. You know, if you're lagging a putt, an overread is good and you'll subconsciously potentially hit it a bit softer. If, you want, if you're putting to make the cut, you're going to be, a, you're definitely not going to leave it short. So now you factor it into your read. So we can change the read based on how aggressive you want the ball to roll for sure yeah. so we so there's malleability with capture speed we call it so it's not a set rule apart from when you learn basic aim point um so so use the capture speed you think's right for the part in front of you adjust your read accordingly we, yeah. we no problems with that so we can, that's one thing we can do we can factor in grain now grain tends to grow downhill so it's actually following slope yeah. and aim point was designed on bermuda greens that are very grainy so we're well aware of grain affecting break and uh you know if grass grows downhill and the grain is uh it's kind of changing stimp shall we say yeah. so downhill an eight stimp can become nine yeah 
uphill an eight stint can become seven. So we factor in grain when it's changing the rate of break. And sometimes when it's very, very flat, the grass doesn't know which way is down. So it will grow against a slight slope. And, you know, it's always, ten if, if you think you're putting on grainy greens, if you've got a very flat area, pay attention to the grain and then you're factoring in minus or plus to break. Yeah. But it's something you deduce from other putts and yeah. on the putting green. So great, without a doubt, we factor grain in when it needs to be, which is not that often. Um, wind, we've, we've got what we call wind charts. And when the flag is, when it's 10 miles an hour at the flag, it, uh, an inch off the ground, the ball is being affected by wind. And we calculated uh, how to change to factor wind in. And it's a little bit different, difficult because of distance of putt, speed of green level of slope so it's not a really nice hard and fast rule yeah but we 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 can factor in how much you know extra arm bend or extra fingers because of wind or less it's we we just haven't found a way of doing it so it's quick yeah so i mean at know, the end of the day it's, it, it's just adapting that player can go yeah well, this feels like a three percent and the wind is slightly assisting that so you know i'm gonna i'm gonna go, go four yeah yeah they're quick greens, so I'm going to go four. You know, they're not quick greens. I'm going to go three and a half. Yeah. And the funny thing about the criticism we get is, and this was when Dustin Johnson won recently, they were saying, oh, yeah, but aim point doesn't factor in grain or wind. And DJ's winning the tournament. They're going, oh, yeah, aim point, but it doesn't do grain. And then you think, well, if you're using your eyes, <laughs> how do you fa are you factoring in grain? <laughs> you know, and we're now back to that first comment of units. Yeah. Aim point gives you a, a metric system. Now you can add or subtract units or pieces of units and make a more educated decision. Yeah. And that's the point because if you just go, yeah, I'm going to aim at that, I'm going to aim that far right. Now, how much do you add for grain? Because if that was a one, 50% is going to be quite a lot. Yeah. But if that's a five, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? You're going to add even more. Yeah. So, so based on your add and subtract for grain or wind, we've also got to give them units. Yeah. Plus, so we, plus you're, you're, you're kind of learning from your own experience. If you, if you yeah. know that it was a two, but it, it felt like a two, but the grain is helping that two and you, exactly. you aim at a two and a half and it misses low, you know, next mm -hmm. time I aim at a three. Exactly. And, and you know, it's, it's like, this is a two. Now I'm going to add or subtract for grain. Yeah. Uh, the, the problem with the commentators is none of them have took the chance to learn aim point. And they just, they just, you know, the only one that did was Nick Doherty and he, he had a fantastic experience of aim point. He, you know, did a lot of stuff with him and yeah, you know, it's, it, I have to watch the television with the sound down when I watch golf because yeah. of the, the, the rubbish you hear, I'm afraid. Yeah. I, I think, I think to the, to be fair to some of them though, they're trying to, they're trying to almost dramatize it a little bit and, um, you know, well, the, enough of them. Space, I used to think that, but enough of them have said enough horrible things on social media as well that now I just think that <laughs> that I'm better off with the sound down. Yeah, yeah. But that's the, that's the thing. People people speculate and and you know make comments about things that they actually don't understand at all. Yeah, and that's that's what drives you mad. Yeah. But there's there's you know there's a I mean. I don't know, four out of the top five at the Genesis use aim point the week before six. It's just we're we're fifty percent of the top ten is using aim point every week. Yeah. And I know that's a bit of a that's a bold call, but it certainly has been that case recently. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, these are players that are already world class. Yeah. Now, you know, I work with a lot of young tour players that are coming through and they've just accepted that aim point is their measurement system and yeah. they're so better prepared than people that aren't using it yeah. i've also worked with people that learn aim point and go do you know what i'm quite happy with my eyes as well and i say good yeah. what are you going to do if you can't see the break and they go i'm going to use aim point and i'm like good that's a aim point fits into your system as much or as little as you want it yeah. we've got tour players that just use aim point in practice yeah i mean that's, that's, that is the point that you, you don't you, you, if you go to an aim point session or if you don't go to an aim point session and you, you have, just have a closed mind about aim point, mm. you're not going to learn anything. If you go to an aim point session and you just want to get better at green reading, there's 
you know, tons of information yeah. that you can learn in how yeah. to understand and just understand slope better. Yeah, and understanding your missed putts. You know, how many times if you go back before aim point, you miss a putt and go, oh, God, it went uphill. Or this green can't, I mean, how many times do you see people just go, oh, this green can't do that? Well, it's physics. It's just the law of physics, right? It's done that because that's what physics intends it to do. So, so, so at the end of the day, um, you know, we, we're believing in mystical forces and, and, and God's against me, you know, it's... Yeah, I mean, that, I mean that's, that's, what, that's what, I guess, um, you know, measuring devices like TrackMan and stuff like that kind yeah. of talk to golf is the fact that it is just physics. You know, whatever happens at impact is just physics. And, and yeah. the main point is discovered, well, you know, slope is just physics. How the ball rolls... It is just physics. Slope is physics. Yeah, and it's, you, once you understand the, the laws... Um, if you make a mistake, you can change the piece that was wrong next time. That's the other thing about it. It's yeah. constant calibration. It's you're always adjusting, adjusting, adjusting for success. I mean, you know, you, you only have to make seven one putts. Seven one putts is like PGA Tour average around. So, yeah. so in that case, you can get it. You can get it wrong eleven times. Yeah. yeah. You know. So, so, and that's the funny thing about putting. It's this finite. Everyone's, everything has to be perfect. I don't get it because you will miss a lot of putts. Yeah. It's about not missing seven. And actually, if you, know? you read it somewhat accurately, you know, most of the time, and then hit, hit and then execute the putt decently, so it's kind of traveling one or two feet past the hole, then mm. you're going to hit a hole more than your fair share than, than the next guy. Well, and that was it. You know, something... I also work on quite early on is missing close. So, you know, get people just shaving, just missing is a good lesson. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to go in the hole um, yeah. because if you miss close enough, they will drop. Yeah. Some will drop because no one's got a perfect start line. So, you know, it's, it swings and roundabouts. You get a lot of people that, that, you know, I'll, I'll have a message from someone. Oh, I lipped out six times today and I go, well, that's six good bucks. Exactly, I love it, and 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 they tend to be fairly optimistic. Yeah. Um, you know, better, it's, it's better, when, you know, the better you are at putting, the more hmm. near misses you're going to have. Exactly, and but the funny thing is, James, is is when you get someone to that stage, they get frustrated with missing, which is amazing. Yeah, they're actually spitting feathers now. Yeah, but it's because they can see how close they are to real performance. So that's an art as well. The player come, oh, I played shit today, and you do the stats, add it up, and you go, well, you you know, you made your you made your quota. Yeah. Yeah, but I missed from seven foot on the last. Yeah. You know, and it's like, and it's there's I always talk to my guys. There's a story, there's an emotional story attached to putting, and they all come, they'll all tell you about the time they shot sixty one. You know, that was the day that I did this and that worked, and it's just a story. Yeah. You know, it's it's just a emotional attachment to, to something in that round that happened. That makes me makes me think of when uh, the general question is maybe a little bit off subject, but someone gets a general question of, well, how did you play today? And it's mm. never related to their score. It's related no. to how well they hit the golf ball. Yeah, it's amazing. Flushed it. Yeah. He's a flusher. That kid's a flusher. Like, well, you, you, know. you do 75 or 65. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, I shot sixty-five, but I didn't hit it that good. I just hold it, and I'm like, no. five. What yeah. about the uh, when someone snap hooks one, and then someone goes, "Yeah, but it didn't go right." <laughs> the habitual slice of go, yeah, I don't mind that because it was, it was drawing. But, but you know, you've got to draw people it. Don't, people don't see the, you know, the bigger picture of golf is actually if you if you improved on and around the greens you're going to oh. shoot better scores than you are, you know, hitting the ball better. Oh, mate. Well, as, but we're both putting coaches and it's, it's always the last piece of the jigsaw, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's, you know. It should be the first thing everyone learns when they play golf. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you a story about that. Was, um, so, uh, Titleist, going back a few years, would give me, give me lots of nice freebies stuff to use in clinics and, let people steal the golf balls and you know it was i'd have brand new dozens of brand new balls every time i went and did clinics all over the world and right. let them just take them and uh so i said okay what what ball do you want me to use and they said pro v1 
And I was like, yeah, but this is a, a club level session. And they go, yeah, Pro V1 is the, is the ball we want them to use. And I'd be like, why is that? And they say, well, a, a 17 handicapper, if, it, if you reduce his slice by five yards, he's not going to score better. If you gain him 10 yards, he's not necessarily going to score better because that guy will go out and miss 17 greens, but he will have more control with his chipping yeah. and a, more, a less volatile yeah. launch with his, with his putting. Yeah. And I was like, wow. Okay. And it was like, I'd spent my whole life giving the shit goal for a, pro, a PTS. And, the, and when you get to single figures, you use Pro-V or Bellata. <laughs> Truth is, the bad golfers should be using these balls that spin yeah, yeah. because they can, they can now control trajectory a little bit better or, or skid and spin and yeah. their putting is more fluid as opposed to like this hot launch from a, a wound ball. Yeah. So yeah, that was, that was amazing for me and, and that just backs up your point exactly which is learn to chip and putt better. Yeah. You hold, then, if you hold three more putts in a round, you shoot three shots better. If you hit every drive 10 yards further, mm. what does that equate to as a score? No. Exactly. Another guy, another guy who's very influential was a guy called Stuart Leong in Australia who brought out a, yeah. um, a stat system called shot, shot by, no, Shots to Hole. Yeah. So Stuart's a real techie guy, a lovely guy, Aussie in Melbourne. And, um, you know, going back a few years, if, as far as giving presentations, I'd always add some of his stats in there because he was a real geek <laughs> and um he said that a 17 handicapper statistically three putts a quarter of all their 20 foot attempts and yeah. i was like yeah. wow you know so so what happens is you see they're hitting it to 20 feet and three putting one in four times they get there and it was like unbelievable so so you know, quite early on, just getting people better at putting from 20 feet. Yeah. You know, you've got a bad golfer. We're looking at the technique, looking at the technique. The best thing you can do is, is, is take them to 20 feet and not three putt. Yeah. And that could be three shots around. Yeah. But we don't do, no one does speed until the, the technique's good, funnily enough. Yeah. Yeah. I think but that's quite, speed is, speed is king for me, you know. And me. And part of, all day long. Speed. To go back to aim point again, like part of your speed is, you know, if you're if you're not going to three putt from twenty feet, if your read is good, yeah, and your speed is good, like yeah, you're never going to three putt. No, and and we're back to and you aim half decent. Every now and then one goes in. Happy yeah. days. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Speed is everything. Speed is is, and we've been doing a lot of the reports for the PGA Tour players recently with. I'm going to plug again, my game forge. We've now got putting graphs in there. Yeah. And what we've seen is this, the, the, a beautiful um, pattern with the, with tour players, which is their, their miss proximities are always tight. So what we're seeing now is no spiking in distance from hole. No. Um, so the tour players, one thing they've got going for them is excellent speed. Yeah. Um, so it is king and I'll share those when we get together the speed graphs because you can also start to see when people are being less aggressive so if their speed is, a, is, is below two feet regularly they're probably not getting the ball past the hole a lot on their birdie putts yeah so think about that for a minute so now we can say you need to be more aggressive right so so on paper their speed's amazing but it's because you need to be a little bit long every now and then. Yeah. Um, now, okay, never up, never in is a real cliche, but it's it's pretty true. Yeah. You know, it's got yeah. if it's not getting past the hole, it's not getting a chance. Yeah. So, 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 so sometimes you can have um, you know the speed can be so good that it's holding you back. Yeah. You know, you need you yeah. need this you need a high you need a long miss. Yeah. But not too many past two foot. And that, I suppose that's where, you know, um, golfers shouldn't have the same speed target for, for every putt, you know? Mm. Well, downhill, uphill, everything changes, isn't it? You, you've got to be flexible with your, your dexterity and speed. It's, yeah. it's about making that decision before, before yeah. you get it wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's, and, and, you know, we did a lot on aim widths, we call them, which is, 
uh, adjusting the reed high and low and changing the speed. Truth be known, on most putts, it's very little difference in start line. Yeah. Um, so the thing is, you know, the high line, the low line, it's good on a quick green on the 4% because it looks very different. Yeah. But the truth be known, it's, it's not much more than two, three inches wider at drop point. Yeah. So, so the point is, it's probably a skill set way above and beyond what they need to do. Yeah. Uh, you're better off going down the middle of the road and keeping within the parameters of an acceptable speed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it goes back yeah, to, so. again, if you have decent speed control and every part, you, you look at, like, I, I always go back to Spieth when he was putting the lights out. Every putt finished a foot past the hole. Yeah. And this is it. And this is why. This is why, you know, we, we teach a foot pass because that's what the best in the world like to do. Yeah. So, so when we start talking about aggressive and, and lag putting for, for, for different distances, I get it. But when you get someone that says, my preference is to do this, it's like, well, okay. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, and, you know, I work with a player, um, pretty, you know, he, he liked to be aggressive. And I bang my head against the wall because he's always three, four foot by regularly. That was his thing. Um, and I just said, right, I'm going to put the ball six inches from the hole and you get it at four or five feet and I'll play for a million dollars. And he was like, why do I want to do that? And I said, well, that's what you do out there. <laughs> and it was like, mm. you know, it was, he thought I was crazy, but that's what's happening in the tournament. Yeah. 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 Um, you, it's just, it it's way. just, his, his opinion. Pardon? You explained it in that way and his opinion of it's a little bit different. Yeah, and it's because he's made a serious amount of clutch putts in mega tournaments where the ball was going miles by, but it's not sustainable in my opinion. No, no, you don't, you don't need that added pressure. It's just a story again, you see. Yeah. You know, he, he, like, just, he did it at the right time, he made a hell of a lot of putts in massive events where the ball was going too far by. Yeah. But you're going to go grey quickly yeah. having four <laughs> footers for par. <laughs> Yeah. right i think i've taken up enough of your time jamie mate that was brilliant you know i enjoyed that i appreciate you. appreciate you coming on and um well i guess to conclude um first of all how can people find out more information right. about you and and come for a session with you sure or, thank or you well, I, coach for that matter yeah well i coach at woven golf club um do all my one-to-ones there and you can get me on uh, Instagram, which is uh, at Aimpoint Golf Europe. Yep. Um, that's a good medium for interaction. Uh, email is jamie at aimpointgolf.co.uk. Yep. Um, and the website for Aimpoint is aimpointgolf.com. Perfect. Um, and on there, if you, there's a little hamburger top right. You click on that. Go to Learn Aimpoint. Shows you where all the classes are all over the world. And if you look, go to, keep going down the drop down menu, there's also become an instructor. So you can click there and, and that will take you to a page that describes the process or registers your interest. So yeah, there's, right. so that's where we, we know who's interested. It's not a straightforward uh, apply you get in. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, and, and I think I'm pretty active on, on Instagram and answer questions and I try and put up relevant, relevant information and, There'd be, I put drill, you know, when we get out to work again, I, I like to post the drills that I'm doing of interest. Yeah. So if anyone sees anything they want to talk about, just drop me a DM. Perfect. Thanks, Jamie. Cool. Well, for your first time, I think you did brilliant. So thanks for having me. Yeah. And You're welcome. I think we could, we could, we could, we'll have to, we'll uh, have to reconvene. We can chat, we can chat for hours. I think we could chat for hours. Come over to Woven for lunch and we'll uh, have a play around and, um, and have a proper chat. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, James. Thanks again to Jamie for sitting down with me yesterday. We could sit down and, and chat for hours, but it was great to find out some information and insights into Aimpoint that I didn't know. Um, great to kind of chat with like-minded people. Um, if you would like to listen to more podcasts like this, there's more coming up in the future. 
as I mentioned at the start, we've already got a couple of podcasts that Jack and Alex have already recorded with Dr. Rob Neal and Dennis Pugh. You can follow us all on Instagram. I am JJ Golf Putting. We've got Alex at Alex Buckner Golf. You've got Jack Bado at Jack Bado Golf and J Kelly at J Kelly Golf Coaching. Like I said, we hope to host more podcasts in the future and we really hope we can keep up the quality of guests as we have so far. So thanks for listening and tune in again soon.